So I'm on one of our terminal servers and I'm firing up PIX, which is the produce inventory control system right here. And um, I have the one in our demo company set to auto login. So it just, as soon as I clicked on it, it went ahead. But there is a really uh, um, comprehensive security model in here where you can set up as many users as you wish and you can control whatever um, the users are able to get at. So if I go to a, a, what I would call a regular user here, Joe, these are all of the things that are in the software and you can highlight whatever one you want. And then over here, you can say whether they have no access, full access or partial. And if you give them partial, uh, they have the ability to add and or edit and or delete. So you get really good control over what people can do, what they can see. And I'm in a super right now. So when I'm in a super, I basically have everything on. So you can see there's lots of different things. There's hundreds of reports. It's, it's actually a little overwhelming how much is in it. But if we were to log on as Joe, so if I just go like this, then it takes away all of the stuff that person doesn't have access to. So in his case, he's basically somebody who would buy and sell. So he gets purchase orders, he gets sales orders, he can look at stock and customers, he can print a handful of reports, and that's about it. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna go back to super, so I have access to everything, okay. Um, so that's the first thing is, is about the security. So you can tweak um, a lot of things in there. Uh, this is basically an inventory and accounting piece of software. So in order to uh, be able to use this in a business, you really need four things. You need um, customers. So you would go to the customer screen and you would set up their code, their name, their address, and then there's a whole bunch of flags and check boxes and stuff that tell the system how to work. You would need vendors to buy products from. So we have a similar looking vendor screen. Again, same thing, a code, name and address, and then a bunch of codes and flags and things to let it know what to do. You also need, um, even at a, at a minimal level, if somebody, we have a full blown accounting system in the software, but some of our customers don't use our accounting. So um, if they don't really need the accounting, they just have to set up the bare minimum of GL accounts. So they would need to have like um, a bank, a receivables account, a payables account, and at least one expense and one revenue. In, in my demo here, I've got a full-blown GL running, so I have a full suite of accounts with, with all kinds of transactions against them and whatnot. And the most important part is inventory. So uh, what we normally do when we get a new customer is we get them to take a look at all of the products that they handle and break them into major groups, which we call categories. And in my demo here, I've got Asian produce, I've got conventional, and I've got organic. And then I've got some other odds and ends um, just to make the demo sort of complete. I also, we also have a growing module in here. So I've got stuff like fungicide, herbicide, pesticide, those sorts of things, if you're doing growing activities with the software. So, and I, I made separate categories for those things. And uh, now uh, when it comes to growing, maybe if you can just highlight some of the dynamics involved and how they work with your software as, as you go through the demo. I will, yeah, I'm, I'm, there's, um, I will. I'll, I'll meander on over to that after I've got some um, um, basics covered. So we'll, we'll see that shortly. Excellent. So um, once you've set up your categories, the next thing that we encourage them to do is to think about what, what in the produce industry are called varieties. So if you were to think about berries, for example, I have, a I have a category called conventional berries. And in that category, I got blackberry, blueberry, gooseberry, strawberry. So you can set up the different types of items. Or if you thought about apples, for example, I've got gala. Actually, I only have gala apples, but of course apples come in all different sorts of varieties. In my peppers, I've got rainbow and red and yellow and orange and so on. So that's what the varieties are for. Sorry, Charles. Yep. Hey Joe here. Um, do you use PLU codes? Yeah, on the um, stock screen, which is where we're headed in a minute, you've got the G10, the HS code, the UPC, the PLU. So right. we're we're just sort of working our way towards building a SKU. Okay. And Joe, thanks for asking because you reminded me. I'm going to touch on all of that import stuff because we've got all of you know the OGD and all of that other junk in here too that would work with your system. Okay. Good. 
So um, let's see. So after we set up the varieties, the next three levels, we, we consider it to be a pyramid. Um, if you think about produce items, they come in different sizes. So if you're thinking about cucumbers, for example, they might come extra large, large, medium, small, and different items do or do not come in different sizes. So we have a size table out here where you can set up the various sizes, and that's what one leg of the pyramid. Same thing with packaging. You might have the thing in like eight five ounce packages in a box or eight one pound packages in a box, or it might just be a 40 pound box, or they might be bags like carrots and bags. So you could have a 10 pound or a hundred pound bag of carrots. So we let you set up the packaging as another leg of the pyramid. And then the third leg is the grade. So uh, again, produce comes in all different grades, depending on what the item is. You know, some things have formal grades like apples. There's international grade standards like extra fancy, fancy and juice. Uh, other things people just call it number one or number two. And other things people sometimes just put in a dash, which means I don't really care about the grade. This thing only has one grade. I'm not worried about it. So if you think about these five things, the category, the variety, and the size pack and grade, they come together to form an item, which is where Joe was just uh, asking about. So this is an item on our item screen. It's got a code. It's in the category of Asian produce. The particular variety is Gailon. Um, in this case, they didn't care about the size, so they just put, they only carry one size, so they just put a dash. <clears throat> They're selling it and buying it by the case, and they don't care about the grade, so they've got just a dash in there for the grade. If you were to look at one other item, I'm gonna go to an apple. This one here, similarly, we got a code, we got a variety, a category variety. These ones are, um, apples are sized by how many go in a box. So um, in this example here, there's 80 of them in a box. So they call that an 80 size apple. You and I would probably call that a small apple. Um, no, sorry, the other way around. This would be large apples because 125s are small. I got that mixed up. Uh, these ones are being um, handled by the case. And these ones are in a premium grade. Then we have what we call the tracking unit. So um, our inventory and all of our sales reports will, by default, uh, talk about the tracking unit of the item. So apples is by the case. We do support something called alternate units. So in addition to cases, you can set up things like bags or bins or eaches. So you can handle any item in different units if you wish. And in this screen, we basically say how many of these relate back to the track unit. Uh, what else we got here? We've got, uh, in, there's some import information. So, uh, Joe, um, I think when you're importing, you need an import unit of measure and how many import unit of measures are in the track unit. Those are two things that um, CRA wants when you're sending them information about what you're importing. Usually just kilos. Yeah, you got kilograms per, um, per track unit as well. So you can put the weight in here. Um, we've got a... Two, two fields here where you can put in the description. So the description, the, the long formal description is a Gala Apple 80 size case premium, but our customers often want to shorten that down to just two lines that print on all the different paperwork. So in this particular example, it's kind of the same thing, but you can change these if you wish. Uh, whether it's active or not there, Joe was asking about the PLU. So for grocery items, you can put in the PLU there. You can also put in the UPC code if you wish. You can put in the HS code, which is a Canadian government code number for stuff that you bring into the country. There's another code, it's nothing but codes in stock these days. There's another code called the Global Trade ID Number. And this is becoming more and more popular out there in that around the world, uh, many companies are publishing their GTIN. So this would be like a public stock number that you're going to exchange with all the people that you do business with. And often um, our customers will go in and set up a G10 for each of their items and then they'll pull some kind of a report off that says, here's my G10s and here's what they are. And they would send that to their trading partners who would then set that up in, in, the, in their software. Okay. <clears throat> 
Uh, what else we got? And uh, then a bunch more. Sorry, go ahead. Somebody have a question? Uh, sorry about that. Pictures just literally attachments in JPEG PNG format, or? Yeah, I think in in, in our software right now they're in uh, I think they're in BMP format. The, that's Microsoft Paint. But yes, you can attach a picture to these items, and those pictures can be printed on various documents. The most popular use for that right now in our software is we have a number of Oriental customers, and when they print their picking slips, um, they print the Chinese symbols for the products on the picking slips, which makes it easier for their staff to pick the orders in the warehouse. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of other, I'm not going to go through every single code and flag, but there's a bunch of other things in here that if you have a question about, great, but if not, I, I, I kind of want to just do this high level so we get through it all. Um, what I was mentioning to Joe earlier is we wrote an interface with a, uh, I guess it used to be one of, I don't know if they're still in business, but one of Joe's competitors, a brokerage firm. And we had the ability to um, take information on a purchase order, package it up in a file and send it to these folks who would in turn send it on to Canada Customs so that when the truck arrived at the border or the ship arrived at the port to bring it into Canada, the government already had all the information that they needed for the for the clearance and statistics and whatnot. So you can set all that stuff up in our software if you're a Canadian company and you want to import into Canada. And I've forgotten what a lot of these mean. I'm sure Joe probably knows very well, but you can go in here and you can put all of this information in um, against the items, and then that just gets used to send it to um, to the government. Yeah, now, Charles, would this would you be giving us this because we normally store that in our database? Yeah, the way that we did it was um, we were. Uh, given the information, like the, the customs broker we work with, they did that too. They had all that stuff in their database, but what they wanted to do was they wanted to have their customer put it in their own database so that the maintenance of all of this stuff fell upon the produce company and their, and their I guess, logistics department. And every time they added a new item, they would set it all up in their own system so that when they transmitted the purchase order to their broker, the PO already had all of this stuff. And I think the broker set their system up to automatically load it into their own system when they got it, but then they could question differences between what the produce company had and what they had. I'm not 100% sure what they all did with it, but um, these guys wanted to become their own, I forgot what the word is, but they wanted to become um, all authorized to do their own free clearances into Canada. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem with that is the, uh, the uh, CFIA is continually changing stuff. Yeah. Right, so it, it's, yeah. It's yeah, a, it's, a big pain, it's a big pain in the rear. I'm actually on that mailing list, so I get the emails every day where they change the stuff, and if you were really trying to keep up with this, you'd have to have somebody on staff who was, who was uh, in charge of doing that. We, we've automated a lot of that process here internally with our software. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, and then we do a fair bit of pricing too. I won't go into it all, but but you can set up um, all kinds of pricing logic in the software. So when they put orders in for their customers, it can already have the prices in. And um, so at a high level, that's a stock item. The other thing I want to show you on the screen is lot. So um, a lot is a particular occurrence of an item. So in this case, these are apples, and I might be just buying these from, a, from an apple orchard or an apple packing house. So I've got this one, which hasn't arrived yet. It's expected to arrive on the 26th. I got this one that did arrive on the 26th, and then I've got other ones that arrived on various different dates. Some of them I still have stock, and these ones down here are sold out now, so the quantity available has gone to zero, and they're just hanging around because there may be still some invoices to be cut or some other work to be done before they disappear off the list. And then I got one down at the bottom here, which is um, not sure why that one is different from the other ones. But anyway, these are the purchase order numbers that I brought these in on. You can drill down into these lots. So this starts getting into traceability. And one of the things that a lot of people are looking for software nowadays around is on this particular Apple, this lot, here's the screen about this particular lot. This came from this vendor. So on purchase order, on my purchase order 1671, I bought these apples from this vendor. And they came in on a truck. So the truck gets a, a number. 
And in this case, it was just a default transportation company. Maybe they picked it up themselves. But you can set up all your trucking companies and, and, and keep track of that. And this one, not much has happened yet. There's uh, 450 available and 450 on hand. So they basically just arrived and they're ready to sell. But if we went back to one that's been around a bit longer, so let's say maybe this one. If I go to the lot screen on this, you can see that there's uh, 67 left. Yeah, so there's none available. There's 67 left still that I own. And those ones are all spoken for on customer orders. So there's 67 that haven't been invoiced yet. All of the orders to the customers are over here. So you can um, get a quick report of what I sold and who I sold it to and how many I sold by doing that. So this is really handy for a bunch of reasons. One of them is if there's a recall, because you need to quickly know who were they sold to and um, how many did I sell? Because you might need to contact these people and ask them to throw them out or to return them. And if you do anything else with the items, uh, the, the other transactions are on this screen as well. So you might like here, we did a stock adjustment. So somebody um, went in and did an adjustment and threw out three cases. I guess three cases went missing, so they did a count adjustment. So, got a question? No, no, we're just, we're laughing at, you know, three cases. Oh, yeah, we ran over them with the lift truck. Uh, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Usually it's they were stolen and we don't know who stole them. Yeah, you know. So, um, going back to the high level for a minute. So, if you have set up customers, vendors, general ledger accounts, and stock, you have everything that you need to run a produce business. And uh, so, produce will arrive in... I guess basically two ways or three ways. Um, one of them would be you would buy it. So you would go to a purchase order and you would create a PO to some vendor and you would say, I want to buy whatever the item is, whatever quantity, whatever price I've negotiated. So there's in, in our software here, there's all kinds of purchase orders in our, in our demo company for things that we bought here. I bought um, some various berries from a berry grower. The other way that product can come into the system is uh, you can grow it. So if I do what's called a grower work order, this is a document where you would say, okay, I'm going to grow carrots, bulk carrots. And in order to grow them, I need seed. And then I need empty those big wooden 1100 pound boxes that bulk carrots go in. I need some bulk empty boxes. I'm going to have all of these different chemicals and fertilizers and whatnot that I use to spray, you know, either treat the ground or treat the product as it's growing or kill bugs or whatever. I've got all kinds of labor involved with growing. So we set up all these different labor things. And then I've also got overhead costs, like what it cost me for my tractors and for fuel and for repairs and for irrigation. So you can put in all of these things in what we call a grower work order and you can put in, how much you used and what the cost of it was. And the purpose of doing all of that is to figure out what it cost you to grow the finished product. So in this case, I got $20,000 worth of cost and I made 800 of those big 1100 pound boxes of carrots. And each of those boxes cost me $25 and 27 cents. So this is another way that inventory gets into the system. It gets in by being grown. And if we took this uh, particular lot number, so these carrots, oh, and let me just see if there's some other examples here too. I don't know if I, I might just have carrot examples in here, but let me just see if there's anything else. Yeah, I just got carrot examples in my grower work order. So if I go to a particular lot and I can see here that I, I have 140 still available, I have 140 available for sale and 140 on hand. Typically what'll happen is they'll grow these carrots in the field and then they'll bring them to a packing house. So some of these guys pack the stuff themselves and some of them just sell the bulk product to a packer. So in this example here, I packed it myself. So I made a, I'm just going to close this grower work order here. I made a, um, what I call a packing work order. So here's that. So it's very similar to the other screen, but what this one is doing is taking those finished 1100 pound boxes of carrots, some of them taking 60 of them, it's taking empty bags and it's taking some labor and some overhead 
And that total value of all of that is $1,500. And it's making them into, in this case, I made 750 pound bags and 525 pound bags. So this screen is taking these things out of inventory and putting these things into inventory. And again, from a traceability standpoint, you can now track the seed to the field that it was planted in, to the bulk product that was grown. And that bulk product that was grown then became finished bags, which I'm then probably gonna sell to uh, grocery stores or uh, food service. You can print labels on all of these steps too. I forgot to show that on the PO screen. On the, on the work order screen and on the PO screen, you can go and print stickers. So I made 25 pound and 50 pound bags of carrots. So if I just go two labels for each, and go like this, I'll show you that back on screen what they look like. So these would be the stickers that they would put on the, uh, on the bags. So here you go. So um, if I can't rotate that. Yeah. So here's a, uh, what, what's called a GTIN sticker. This is a industry standard sticker that um, produce companies are encouraged to put on all of their products. So it's got their logo, the description of the item. It's got a barcode on it so that they can scan it or their customers can scan it. It's got the GTIN. So this is that global trade ID number again. It's got the lot number, which is, uh, a lot number that our software assigned that keeps track of this particular block of product. And then in this case, we've also got the date that it was packed. And we have uh, this thing up in the corner is called a voice pick code. There's some larger produce companies out there like Whole Foods and Walmart in the States that have very large warehouses where their staff pick orders with a headset and a microphone. So they just go up to the product on the shelf and they'd say 4741 and then they'd get an indicator in the headset as to whether or not that's the right item to pick. So that's what the voice pick code is for. And I just printed four stickers here. So there'll be um, a couple of different items with different codes on them, 25 pounders and 50 pounders. So the same way, um, I, I skipped it earlier, but I'll go back to it. If you do a purchase order, when you buy product from a vendor, it's kind of the same thing. You need to go put the product in and then you would hit the label button and you would print stickers, which you would then put on the products when they arrive. So that's kind of the way that inventory gets in. You either buy it or you grow it or you buy or grow it and then pack it into other products. And the next thing and probably the most important thing is that you sell it. So uh, we have a sales order screen and again, sort of similar look and feel to the rest of the software, they would go here. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, I'll mention it now. You might find some of this a little overwhelming because there's just tons and tons of fields on all the screens. So not all our customers use all of this stuff and this stuff can be configured. So uh, you see, this is a sales order screen with absolutely everything turned on. And if I were to go back like I did at the beginning and go back in as Joe, when Joe goes into the sales order screen, his has been configured to turn off a whole bunch of that stuff. So he doesn't have to see or deal with some of those other complexities that, that whoever configured the system for him knows that he doesn't have to worry about. So I'll go back to uh, Super Packer and, um, sorry, to Super. And go back to the sales order screen. So um, a fairly, standard sales order would be, I would, I would do an ad. So I'd hit ad here. I would choose who I want to sell it to. So I'd pick a customer. Uh, that customer might have multiple locations, so I can pick a ship to. I can go in here and usually, uh, well, not always, but, but you know, you could pick the salesperson that sold it. Um, you can truck routes if you wish, where it's getting loaded. Uh, customer might have a PO number they gave you for this purchase bunch of other odds and ends here. And then what you want to do is get down into the product. So you've identified who you're selling it to and where it's going. You've got their PO number. Then you might start putting in items. So if I did, for example, a, uh, um, a, a an apple, and I just happen to know the code, maybe the customer wants uh, 40 cases of apples, 
the system supplied a selling price. Um, you can see over here that it also supplied the cost. So if I have the appropriate rights, I can see how much money I'm making and what percentage and all of that stuff. So I'll do a save. And that basically recorded the fact that Holiday Inn wants 40 cases of apples and I'm going to be selling them at 10 bucks a case. They might also want some uh, vegetables. So if I go CV for conventional vegetables, maybe some spinach salad. And they want, to, you know, 30 cases of that. They're $12.25, $10 cost, so I'm good there. So you basically just tell the computer what the customer's asking for, and it'll build an order. When I save that order, uh, they can email a copy of the order to their customer if you want. So if I say, yes, I want to see, send out a confirmation, it will email uh, whoever at Holiday Inn that's been set up to get a copy of that order so Holiday Inn can you know, the buyer at Holiday Inn can look at it and go, yeah, they got the order right, or no, they got it wrong. That isn't the price I agreed to, or that isn't the quantity I asked for, or whatnot. And then once you've got the order in there, um, there's a couple things you can do. You can um, just print a picking slip. So this would be fairly commonly done. You print this document, which you would give to somebody in the warehouse, and they would go and get all of the stuff together. So. I'll just print one of those right now back to screen so you can see it. So here's a fairly straightforward, simple picking slip where the customers ask for 40 cases of apples and 30 cases of spinach salad. Your warehouse worker would write down how many they actually got. And ideally they would write down the lot number off the sticker. So if you printed stickers and put them on the product, then they could write down the lot numbers, which is how uh, the system is going to get told which specific lot got shipped to that customer, and that's how traceability happens in the system. It, it, it knows what, got, what came from where and what went to where. Uh, the other possibility is we have a, uh, a barcode, um, we have a barcode picking system with handheld devices too. So uh, the other way to go would be you print the picking slip. It has a barcode, you'll notice at the top, and then um, I'll go over here and fire up the um, handheld version. So if you would envision, um, where's my home? There we are. If you would envision some kind of a gizmo like an iPhone or an iPad or a handheld scanner, um, we have customers who would use a device like that. Let's see here, new shipment. Who would use a device like that on a um, little window. So I'll just make this look a little bit more like a you know, like an iPhone. So, you know, maybe something like that. So they would log in here and they would take the, uh, the picking slip, which was given to them to pick, and they would scan this barcode. So on this one, the order number is 4325. So when they scan it, it's going to put 4325 in the little window there. And then they would potentially hit verify, which will just show them that this is indeed for that holiday in order. And then they hit save. And then it'll go to another screen and it's ready to scan the uh, stickers on the boxes. So they would point this thing at those labels and scan and it would put in, you know, whatever the code is on the sticker in that box. And then they would uh, validate that or verify that. And I have this configured in a different way right now. So I can't show you the next screen at the moment, but that would bring up another screen saying, uh, yeah, here's the item, here's how many the customer asked for, here's how many I'm going to ship, and then they would just say okay. So they basically walk around with the picking slip and going up to the various different items and scanning the stickers and shipping. So that process will end up putting in the quantity shipped. So you'll have an order where the customer asked for 40, and you'll ship hopefully 40, um, and you may ship one or more lots. And then the same thing for the spinach salad. So I'm going to uh, put in a couple of shipments manually, just so you can see it going in here. So if I do an if I do an edit here and I go up and I pick the screen, so I've got two items on this order. I get apples. Customer had asked for 20 of them. So I'm going to go choose. Let's say, sorry, he asked for 40 of them, not 20 of them. Um, I'm going to go and choose 20 from this lot. So I'm fulfilling his half of his request with a particular lot. And then I'm going to go and pick a different lot. And this happens quite often in a lot control situation where they're getting different ones. So 
If I go out here and I pick 20 more of those, you can see that we're giving them a total of 40, but it's two different lots. And then if I do the spinach salad um, and I pick a lot here, if I got any, if I do, I got this in inventory, so I can do that and I can sell all 30 of those out of that lot. So if I go back to the sales order, the customer asked for 40 and I gave him 40, but it puts these asterisks here to indicate that this was fulfilled with two or more lots. And for the spinach salad, it's uh, he asked for 30 and I gave him 30 and they all came from the same lot. So that's kind of the buy, uh, sorry, the selling and the shipping process. You need to tell the computer what the customer asked for and then you need to tell it what they actually got. And you can see all of the money things at the bottom here, like the total value, the cost that it cost me, uh, the profit that I'm making in dollars, the margin I'm making in percentages, the weight, the number of items. Uh, over here, I had Holiday Inn set up with a rebate, so it calculated a $15.35 rebate that's going to go back to them. And um, Oh, and outbound loads, too. Let me show you this. So you might be taking this order and throwing it on a truck to deliver to Holiday Inn. So you can create uh, a truck here. I'm going to go create a new one. And um, I've got Joe's Trucking in there. And I'm going to put on here that this particular order, Joe's Trucking is going to charge me outbound freight of, let's say, $100 to deliver that to the customer. So if I do that, and then I go back over here, now you're going to see that not only was there uh, a rebate, but there's also $126 of uh, outbound freight. It's 126 because Joe's Trucking is a U.S. company and there was exchange on the $100. So that was 100 bucks U.S. And so $126 is there, which reduced my profit down to 75. Um, what else can I show you? Charles, is there a place to put a, a, ex, a container number for uh, export shipments out of uh, the islands, for example? Yeah, I think on the shipping screen, there's a bunch more, oops, wrong one. On the shipping screen, I think there's a bunch more spots to put, um, let's see here. There's the number, there's an appointment date, an appointment time, an appointment number, uh, marks and numbers. Yeah, not specifically the container number, um, but you could put it, you could probably put it in the marks and numbers field, or you could put it um, on all our screens, there's this note window where you can write a story and it stores that, and then you can print that on all your paperwork as well. And if that was actually something that was specifically needed, we could also add code to do that. So um, we often get new customers who have requirements that we haven't got in the system yet. So we'll usually code that stuff as we get to sale and as we go forward. Yeah. See, I, I don't know how much uh, you were told about the, uh, the process we're looking at. Uh, ideally, I mean, this very high level again, we're, we're looking at uh, getting produce out of the islands at the moment uh, uh, right. Canada, yeah. uh, from the farm uh, to a distribution point where a, an export container would be loaded and then loaded onto a ship and then the ship comes to uh, Miami and then my, from Miami it's trucked up here to Toronto. That's right. Canada, right? So that's what so we, is, sorry, go ahead. That, that's what we're really looking at. And as part of that, the container number would be uh, a critical factor in, in tracking the shipment. Okay, so is the container um, actually owned by the company that's doing the shipping, or is the container provided by the shipping company? Mitch? Yep. The container would be owned by the Ocean Line, wouldn't it not? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. So now the reason I asked is we have a different style of inventory handling where we, we call it storage unit storage unit controlled inventory. Let me just throw a couple switches here and turn that on. So this might be one way to do what you've asked for. I'm going to go to my purchase order system here and change a switch. <clears throat> so here's a slightly different flavor. This would be if the produce company itself were uh, filling up a container with multiple products. So, no, sorry, this wouldn't be on a purchase order, it'd be on a sales order. So, um, they could, let's just see if I can do this for you here. So, I'll pick a customer. Maybe I'll go to somebody like Loblaws. And I will go and find a product that has storage unit inventory. So, that would be, 
Um, do I have any of those? No, let me see. Don't have any of those. Yeah, I don't have any in stock, so it's a little tricky. Uh, well, maybe this one. So um, if the customer wanted, um, how many of these? There's 40 on a pallet, so let's say 400. So uh, these are, uh, the sales order kind of looks the same, but the shipping side changes such that you're going to be using um, container IDs. So here, I've got these 400 um I've got these 400, uh, whatever they were, onions on pallets, and the pallets have IDs. So no, this isn't actually going to do the trick either. Uh, what I was thinking was you could create a storage unit for the container, and you could put all of the products in our system into the container and then ship the container. That's where I was kind of heading, but I'd have to do a little bit of setup and configuring to make that all work. And but we and could do that. Sorry, Charles. So that, that actually was a question I was going to ask. So storage unit specifically with respect to how you further package or um, okay it's just a packet another um, packaging or group unit for your stock yeah I would say group unit is a good word because it because okay. it's typically it's a pallet and one pallet could have multiple items on it so you would create a pallet ID and then you would put the items on the pallet and ship the pallet but you could it, it's Flexible, so you could also potentially do that with a container where you could say I want to put all of these different items into a container and then ship the container. Okay. You use the like trailer numbers like with the trucking? Is that what, sorry, what was that? For product product? Sorry, can you say that again? Would you use trailer numbers for like for example a truck you loaded a whole trailer of tomato just for argument's sake? That trailer would have an ID. That, that yeah, I think that you're talking about. Yeah, the trailer ID might be. Uh, let's let's print a uh, print a pro forma. I'm not sure what documents are on. Let's just print a pro forma and see. Yeah. Well, I mean, at, uh, just the North American stuff. That that's where things are heading right now. Yeah, so, I mean, we might need to get together and add a few fields to the screens and to the reports to make sure this completely handles uh, all of the things that are um, that are needed but uh, I've got some of that in here now so I think if I print a pro forma this is a document that we're doing with another Joe one of your competitors again some of our not so I'm probably I don't yeah so I don't have everything completely set up but we can produce a document I know I can show it to you here we have one on our website um, there's a all of our uh, all of our sample reports are on the website here so let me just take you over there and show you what, it, what the pro forma looks like. Uh, let's see, products. And uh, sample reports. And a pro forma is there. what broker you're, you're talking about. Yeah, it's probably Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> so there's uh, there's the pro forma that the software will produce, and it has a whole bunch of stuff about the shipment on it. So uh, I'm not sure, Joe, if that particular field you're talking about is one of these boxes, but... Um, yeah. so normally it's not. That's, that's usually on the, in the transportation end. Okay. But, but for this product, for this, for this project we're talking about, it's yeah, part of the, uh, let's say, bill of lading, for example, but the bill of lading would not be something issued uh, within your system. It would be issued by the ocean carrier. We do, uh, we do have the ability to produce a bill of lading because some of our customers make their own. So if I went and did that on this one, uh, let's see what a bill of lading looks like. But I think that uh, I would kind of summarize it to say maybe after the demo we need to just talk offline and figure out what to put where to make sure that it's there so that as we're showing this to prospective customers we have everything covered right yeah so there's a there's a bill of lading that the software can produce so there's a carrier number coming out of the vendor and um, 
the product again and some other stuff, the PO number and whatnot. So we do have the ability to produce bills of lading, or as you say, it might be the transportation company that's doing it. Um, so from a, going back up to the high level, so we've talked about bringing in inventory and sending it out. Uh, there's a full inventory count process, so you can, you can have them do an inventory count and use the software to help them get that done so that they can get the quantities in the system updated to be accurate. Uh, there is a full-blown um, accounting system, as I mentioned, so when they bill people and get paid, they can put in the payment. When they get bills from vendors, they can put in the invoices and then they can create checks and pay their vendors. There's a general ledger in here that'll give you all of the financial information for the business, and the financial statements and whatnot. Um, we've touched on the other core stuff. And then there's a few other odds and ends like um, repackaging. If you take a pallet of stuff and you go through it and throw out the bad one, you might do something like, um, here, I took, uh, I took 100 cases of carrots and I went through them and I ended up with, oh, in this case, I put them into smaller packages. I took 125 pounders and made them into 210 pounders. That sort of thing. Um, or here's one where I took uh, a thousand cases of cucumbers. I went through them. I threw out the bad ones and I ended up with 700 uh, good ones afterwards. And that, when you do that, it generates a new lot number. So the traceability is maintained. You know, you can do adjustments and transfer from warehouse to warehouse and reservations and a few other odds and ends. Uh, the, the other, there's one other module I'll briefly touch on because it may, we may run across this. Um, there are certain kinds of, uh, yeah, actually, John talked about this. There was a co-op. He was talking about a co-op. Um, there are uh, deals between growers and packing houses where the grower says, okay, I will grow all of my stuff and I'll bring it to you. And the, uh, so sometimes those are called marketing companies as well. So the marketing company will say, all right, I'll give you 15% of whatever I get for the product. So the, the uh, product is sold from the farmer and, and bought by the marketing company uh, with no price yet. And then the marketing company will go and take care of packaging it, distributing it, um, you know, coming up with the price for it, negotiating, doing all of that stuff. And at the end of the day, after it's all sold, they can use this screen in our software to calculate the return that goes back to the grower. So they um, would go in here, they would do an ad, they would put in a range of dates to cover the dates that the product was received. It will flood into this screen here all of the items that were received from that vendor on that date or on that range of dates. And then it will go and say, okay, I brought in this many, I've got this many left. Uh, this is the average price that I got for selling it. Uh, if I did package, this is packaging, labor, and overhead. So if I did packing activity, it will subtract the cost of the packaging materials, the labor, and the overhead. It comes to a net price. And then it says, okay, I've brought in 100. I'm going to pay them for 100, and I'm going to pay them 26.75. So it it uh, does all of that work and all those calculations to figure out what to pay the farmer or the grower. So that's a, another module that's in our system and that might get used by some of these people we're thinking about selling to. Let's see. Yeah, I think, I think that largely covers it. We have a ton of reports. We, have a, we do a ton of importing and exporting, which I think we're already talking about with uh, with the very folks on the calls here, we're probably going to have data flowing in and out of our software and in and out of your various different software. And I think that covers it. So um, I kind of open it up for more questions if there are any. Uh, what existing uh, EDI uh, exporting and importer routines do you have right now? Uh, we have quite a bit. We have um, a few customers that are pretty much automated where the, the, uh, the 810s, Sorry, the um, 850s come in. Um, we have a we have a import and export system that we run on the Windows scheduler, so it wakes up every whatever you want, every hour or something. It'll connect by FTP to their trading partner or to the EDI company, and it will pull down any documents that need to be received, and it'll send up any documents that are waiting to go, like invoices and things. Uh, and then it'll, uh, if you wish, it'll automatically create sales orders in our software for 850 purchase orders that are coming from your customers. 
Um, it will, uh, on the other side, it'll send out advanced ship notices or invoices to your customers after you've shipped or invoiced product. Uh, we did one system for one customer with payments where they're getting, uh, I think it's an 820, where they get a payment advice from their customer, which details what invoices are being paid, and then that gets imported as a receipt. Um, we got that going on probably with, I'm going to say probably about 15 to 20% of our customers do fairly heavy EDI with most of the major chains in Canada and some of them in the States. Okay. Those, those tend to be uh, worked out on a partner by partner, document by document basis. That's usually how it works. So I, I would envision with what we've been talking with uh, John and Warren about over the last couple of years, we'd probably figure out how to send that into their system and then they would take care of the other side. 100%, okay. No, it sounds good. I think uh, you said it right too with that, that last part. It's, it's a, a solid system and as a base, we can just custom tailor it to suit. So whether it be um, how we ship via containers or ship via trucking and freighting, as well with the EDI on schedule or with FTPs and with documents, we can really um, take the data and uh, reshape it to suit each respective system. Yeah, yeah. I forgot we also do, um, with Walmart, there's a different thing. I think it's called AS2. I'm not, I'm not really totally up on the tech, but my, my programmers do that. But with Walmart, there's a different protocol for sending stuff that's more secure than just FTP. And we do a fair bit of that because quite a few of our customers sell to Walmart. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same as the banks use. Okay. They have to. So, um, oh, I guess the other thing I should show you is, um, yeah, I, I should have touched on this too. Everything that you just saw is all in our regular main PIX program. We have two other user interfaces. I did touch on the handheld a minute ago, but there's also a touchscreen suite called vPix. So if I fire that up, this is designed for people to use, if you will, on the warehouse floor. So, uh, for example, I could uh, call up a list of purchase orders. So I could have this maybe at the back door when product is arriving. And um, I would bring up this, this uh, screen, which is designed to be used on a touchscreen monitor. So you would have big fat buttons and uh, there's no money in any of these. It's really more intended for the warehouse people. So they bring up a purchase order list. They would touch there and up would come a list of all the purchase orders I'm expecting. So I could say, okay, you know, the, the purchase order from BC Berry Growers is here and I had some stuff on that purchase order. I can go over here and I can either do a receive all or I can go to the receiving screen and I can individually receive um, lines on this particular purchase order. Please excuse my server, it's a little slow today. I think it needs a coffee. <laughs> So I'd hit the item that's come in. I could say, uh, you know, 432 came in or no, only 400 came in, for example. I could save that. I can print stickers from here. So um, this can be put out in the warehouse and this is live real time connected to the main program I just showed you. So some of our customers have their users using this to do the actual physical receiving and printing of stickers. And the same thing with uh, work orders. We have customers who make products in their packing plant and they use the work order system on a touchscreen monitor to actually tell the computer what's being made and what's being used as they go. So that's just a different user interface, but it's pretty popular with some of them. So here I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing carrots or whatever, onions. So you can go in here and you can post uh, what you made. It's got the output, these are the outputs, the OP or the outputs and the IP or the input. So that's another user interface that we have that uh, is popular with some customers. And th the other one is the web. Um, I could show you, yeah, I guess I should probably show you the online ordering too. So there's also an online ordering system in here. Let me cheat for a second to get the customer 100, 362. Uh, so um, this would be if any of the people we're trying to sell our software to want their customers to buy online, they could give their customers a user ID and password, and those people could go to their website, and they could log into the website. They could say, you know, I want my order. Um, maybe I want it on uh, May. Third. 
and then they could say proceed, and it brings up basically a grid of all of the products that have been configured, and you could say, okay, I want 12 of those, and I want three of those, and I want four of those, and then they could submit, summarize, sorry, and then that will take them to the bottom, so here they can see, uh, you know, the total, they can see the items they ordered, they can remove items from here, they can send a message, and then if they submit, that will then get synchronized into our system as well. So you can have online ordering for your customers into our software using this thing. Solid. And yeah, so that's one other module we have. If a client um, wanted to create their, their, you could say, front end or their intake, they can later export that through EDI to you as well, right? Yeah, we have import, yeah. So the same way the EDI works, you, if, if you want to do, uh, we, we call that um, in-house EDI, where you work out with one of your trading partners, the file format, and then they can just email you or FTP you a file. We can import that in directly too. You don't actually have to go through ANSI standard EDI formats because there's a lot of people that cut out that complexity and just do it between each other. Okay. Yeah, we actually, for example, we have customers, we have some customers of ours that own multiple companies and they have their different companies that they own trading with each other using imports and exports between so it's from picks to picks just running in two different servers and two different companies okay cool no I'm, I'm great especially with that last part um there's virtually nothing that we can accomplish given your platform and just a little bit of um uh data mapping yeah exactly and I think that uh, from what I've seen, the tool that uh, Warren and John have is awesome for the data mapping side. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. So um, let me just go through my menu here and see if there's anything else that I missed. I think I've covered most of it now. So we've got, we've got um, covered picks. We've covered uh, V picks. We've covered web picks. Those are our three platforms. Oh, yeah, and then there's a, um, yeah, the other one is our report engine. We have a very... Um, sophisticated reporting tool which allows custom reports scheduled reports you can email them you can do all sorts of fancy stuff with reports and uh, analytics and charts and graphs and all that kind of stuff so um, if people want to slice and dice the information in their business a bunch of different ways or make exception reports etc cetera, etc cetera, we've got a really powerful tool for that as well it's called the PIX report engine <laughs> 